Hey there, welcome to Farmcraft. I'm John, this is my boom lift, and it needs more work. And this is a perfect example of why it needs more work. It's stuck right now, I can't move. It's been raining some, the ground is a little soft, the wheels have sunk it in a little bit. Not that bad, yeah, that one looks pretty well in there. Yeah, that's probably the worst one. These are flat free tires, so none of these tires are flat. And you can see I've been trying to move it, it won't, it won't go. But even worse, when it won't go, oftentimes this is the only wheel that'll spin. And I think what's happening, that wheel has a broken spring brake assembly, uh, which is where the drive shaft goes through and engages with the, with the gearbox for the wheel. So that wheel is basically freewheeling. There's a splined shaft there that probably mates with that and goes up inside there. And the motor is in there and it's free to spin. And I think what ends up happening is all the fluid goes through that motor because there's no resistance on it and I don't get significant power to any of the other wheels. So it gets stuck a lot, really easy. I mean, this just doesn't seem like it should be stuck right here. So, uh, I want to fix that. See that? Nothing. The only thing spinning is that free hydraulic motor. There, that one wheel. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I even tried driving it out while simultaneously pulling with a 12,000 pound winch uh, hooked to my truck here. All I succeeded in doing was pulling my truck backwards. So I don't have a replacement brake assembly yet, but I decided to disconnect the hydraulic motor and cap all the lines and see if that made any difference. It should send more power to the other motors because no fluid will be able to flow here. This is a four-wheel drive unit. There's a motor on each wheel. I've been thinking that I've been running in three-wheel drive, but I think with this motor in here free spinning, I don't think I'm even doing that. So it still couldn't drive itself out, but the wheels were pushing much harder. And I had tried with the winch previously unsuccessfully. So now with the winch and three wheels actually pushing, I'm able to drive out of here. So it's an improvement. I think it's time to fix that spring brake assembly. So I've got one on order. So another thing that I probably should have fixed a long time ago is my water temperature gauge. It is always stuck right there. I think the gauge is the problem. This thing's wired kind of funny. The, the wires to this are coming off of the brain box. The temperature sensor goes to the brain box. So I'm not exactly sure, but I found a cheapo gauge on Amazon that has the exact same wiring terminals on the back. So I'm gonna try to throw this on and let's see what it does. It would be nice if this new gauge just goes on here and works because otherwise I'm going to have to look at wiring diagrams and I don't like wiring diagrams. <laughs> That's just a blanket statement. Don't like them. 
This is the only reading I ever get out of this gauge. I turn the ignition on and I get a reasonable reading of the water temperature. So I'm gonna start this thing up and um, run it for a little while and I'll put all this back together while we're doing that and see if it's right. That would be nice. So according to it, it's running at like 250 degrees, which is not correct. Coming out here, the bottom is barely warm. The top is barely warm. The engine block is 150 degrees, 170 degrees. The cooling system's working fine. That gauge is not correct. But, you know, it was only a $10 gauge and it answered a question for me. I think the system is probably okay. It's just that gauge is calibrated for a different temperature. Um, so maybe I call JLG and see how much it would be to get a new gauge. Might be worth having, because if this thing's overheating, that's the only way I'm going to know until it's the wrong way to find out. I checked with JLG. A new gauge was going to be $125. Not going to happen. Do you wonder now why I hate wiring diagrams? <laughs> All right, after staring at this for a while and getting cross-eyed several times, this is what I figured out. Here is my water temperature gauge, and it comes to a white-violet wire. It comes all the way down into this terminal block labeled number 12. These dotted lines are the outputs from this side of the terminal block. There's number 12. It again says white-violet, and it goes to water temp sender. I know where the water temp sensor is on the engine. And it has two wires connected directly to the engine ECM, just like this one. Engine coolant temp sensor, and it has two wires, and they go to the brain box of the engine. So, what is that? <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing I got out the diagram. So, all right, white, violet, we need to find out where this is going. All right, for orientation, here's our water temperature gauge. I can tell you all the wires come out of the back and go that way through this thing. I can't easily show you. And then they come out there into this big bundle of wires here. And if you look right there, you can see water temp, and that is a white violet wire. So there we are. And coming out of the other side, it's also white violet, and it's heading that way. So let's see where that goes. Just so you know, up here on the engine, right there, is the coolant temp sensor. This is another coolant temp sensor that's not hooked into anything. This is used if you have a fuel injected version of this engine. So that's doing nothing. This coolant temp sensor, I've traced the wires, it comes back and goes into the brain box. And quite honestly, I'm not sure what the brain box is doing with that. And it probably is doing nothing with it. It's probably totally unnecessary because this thing's a carburetor. It's not sending it to a readout apparently. And yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's doing anything at all. This is my wire here. I traced it around and I actually took it off. It goes to that sensor right there that my finger's on. Apparently we have another coolant temp sensor right there. And of course it would be on the tough side of the engine. <laughs> All right, here's the plan. That one that's back behind there can just stay there. And I'm gonna disconnect it. And this one right here is not being used for anything. I am going to replace that one with the temp sending unit that came with the gauge that I bought. So this little guy is the temp sending unit that came with the temperature gauge. So I know that'll work, and it's just a single wire hookup. The only issue is it's 1 8 NPT threads, and I need to go to 3 8 NPT. And of course I don't have a bushing on hand for that. And as usual, I'm too impatient to wait. 
you know, there's no stores near me that I could drive and go get this. I'd have to drive for at least half an hour, probably longer, you know, half an hour there, half an hour back. I can work for an hour and a half making one of these, and it's not a waste of my time. Now, yeah, I could order it on Amazon and just wait, but then I just have to sit and wait for however many days. Uh, we don't get this uh, next day and afternoon delivery out here either. So people wonder, you know, sometimes like, why, why are you wasting your time making one? Well, I don't really think it is a waste of time. Plus I enjoy it. So we need a 3 8 NPT to a 1 8 NPT adapter. So I'm going to be doing a 3 8 die to a 1 8 tap. Let's make a bushing. Piece of scrap brass from a previous melt. Darn it. I was thinking about my next operation, which I was thinking was going to be putting the hex on for the bolt. I should have threaded that before I parted it off, but eh, whatever. I can still thread it, but that's stupid. There, that'll allow me to push on that as I'm threading it without um, having to squeeze so hard that I crush it. That was helpful for getting it centered so that it doesn't start cutting crooked. But now that I'm on there, yeah, I think I just need to get this off of here and uh, go ahead and hex head it. That took entirely too long because I should have just threaded it before I parted it off, but we got it. A little bit of thread tape there and that'll be nice and tight. This last little bit is the part that matters and it is going to be mostly covered up by this. So what I'm gonna do is drill that out a little bit right at the end, just to make it bigger so that there'll be plenty of room for engine water to get around this and give me an accurate temperature. All right, here is the temp sensor that's doing nothing. All I need is to hook up this wire. Click. Okay, I got the wire all in the loom and everything attached. Here you can see the white coming through. And now we need to put it right there. So let's start this thing up and warm it up and see if the water temperature gauge is going to work. So uh, I think it's reading a little bit low. 
I looked over the Amazon reviews and one of the most common complaints was that the gauge was inaccurate and it would read 80 degrees low. Maybe I'll get a, a better quality gauge and put it on here. Reading. That's what you get for cheap gauges. Okay, so I got a better gauge. This one's made by Equus. Cost about 25 bucks, had pretty good reviews. And it comes with its own sensor as well, but I bet you the sensor that I got will work. Uh, if it doesn't, this will be easy to change out. This one even came with a bunch of adapters, so I wouldn't have had to make my own adapter for this one. The better one has spade terminals on it, and it also doesn't mount the same way, like these mount with this bar. The cheap gauge worked exactly like the old one, at least it mounted and hooked up like the old one did. Didn't work though. Hopefully this one will work, but I've got to change the spade connectors and then we have like this screw on thing that locks it into place. And I'm tagging this red just so that I know this is the, the hot. There's a hot, there's a ground and there's a sensor wire. ground and I'm labeling the sensor wire blue so this guy goes positive sensor ground sensor ground positive These wires are just for a light. I don't even really want them to work. I don't need a light on the gauge. One more thing I wanna do. You can see all these loose wires here. These all go over across and into the engine bay. And I just don't like those not being better protected. So I got some wire loom and I'm gonna wrap those up. Well, without too much trouble, I was able to get that loom all the way across. So it's uninterrupted. So that's nice. Everything uh, is in loom now on that wiring harness. I'll keep pulling it until I get it all the way up to here. See all these wires just hanging out. Just a matter of time before one of them rubs through and then I'm troubleshooting an electrical issue that I don't want to do. There, loom starts right here. And you can see the whole harness now is in loom. It goes all the way across to here. And this I'm okay with. So I want to see if my water temperature is going to work. So I'll let it sit here and run for a little while. All right. Apparently it wasn't the gauge. It was the sending unit or the, the sensor. So I'm going to change that out for the new one that I got in this gauge. Well, look at this nonsense. I guess this is the nature of troubleshooting things. I, I Even with the new sensor, I didn't feel like I was getting an accurate water temperature. And it occurred to me, this thing is, is a piece of plastic that, that it's screwed into. Maybe it needs a ground connection on the housing of the uh, sensor because it's only got one wire. So how's that gonna work? So I just took this, uh, this little alligator clip jumper and I jumped that to ground and when I have it hooked up like that it gives me an accurate reading. This is without the ground wire and I am hooking the ground wire up right now. So I need to run another wire. I'll probably put it between the the two threads and then I can just run it over here and ground it. Good grief. Here you can see I just used a ring connector on the sensor and then ran it over to this bracket which is bolted to the block. I ran it for a while and it came up to temperature right around where I would expect it to be with the thermostat open. So there we go. Finally, the water gauge is working. The gauge is fixed. I need a break. Great time for a bonfire.
right, enough partying. Let's get back to making this thing four wheel drive. This is the brake assembly that was broken. I need to fix this for a couple reasons. I think that these hydraulic lines being capped are robbing some of my power. I think it's deadheading against this uh, when it shouldn't be. I'm not sure about that, but they definitely needed to be capped because then, you know, the other wheels didn't have any power because this was just free spinning. So having a fourth wheel that is not just capped, but is also uh, contributing to the locomotion, let's say, um, I think that's going to help a lot. And I'm hoping that it's going to help with some of the deadheading and actually increase power to the other functions of the machine. This thing didn't come with any bolts. That's going to be fun. So inside here is a spring brake assembly. Unless you apply hydraulic pressure to one of these ports, it locks the brakes and it locks the wheel. And then the hydraulic motor is going to plug in there. So you can actually see right there where the gasket went. And that's all rough from being exposed for so long. All right, let me see if I can find some bolts for this thing. OK, the other side has studs on it. And uh, so I'm just putting some blue Loctite. And we're going to put studs on this side. I thought about using bolts, but uh, studs will definitely be easier to put together. Giving it the old classic reach around. Perfect. This is the hydraulic hose that releases the spring brake. I got one more hose on the other side, and that ought to do it. Get off of there. Great. That was a gusher. We now have four wheel drive again, in theory. So something else that I've been needing to do on this machine for a long time, and just haven't gotten around to it, shame on me, is changing the oil that's in these hubs. Now this one I'm pretty sure has water in it because this is the one I just replaced the brake assembly. So it had an open hole to the inside. So lots of condensation and potential for, for water to get in. It's moving. <clears throat> and of course this thing's going to dump oil all over the place. So I went and got a piece of uh, six inch flue pipe that I just have laying around. And I can get that underneath there and basically use it as an open funnel to get it into a catch pan. That's what that oil looks like when it doesn't have water in it. All right, I let this thing drain for a couple hours actually. Working on some other stuff. So there's another plug right here. 
they're 90 degrees from each other. So when one of them is straight down, the other one is going to be to the side. And you're supposed to fill this thing half full of oil. Here's a, a hole right here. So I'm going to pump gear oil in there. When it starts to weep out the side, we're full. Put in the plugs. Done. Six hours later. There it is. If it's going to leak, I want to know it. Well, the last wheel doesn't want to play nice, so I'm going to have to do some... Uh, some things on it here. I've got the drain plug right there. I think it's stripped, unfortunately. So I need to get this wheel so that I can spin it. And the way you do that, there's a spring brake in here, but if you turn this cap around, this protuberance there will push and disengage the spring brake. Just like caging the brakes on a, uh, on a truck. I had actually already done this to um, get that drain plug down. I shouldn't have uh, put it back together, because now I'm doing it again. Okay, so that wheel is now free to spin. So let me go get a bottle jack and I can pick this up and we can rotate that around so I can get to that plug. All right, this whole thing weighs 32,000, four wheels, so 8,000 a wheel, but there's actually probably a little more. There is a little more because the boom is on that side. My regular floor jack would not be able to lift this. The plug is only partially stripped. I can still torque on it a little bit, but if I mess it up anymore, it's going to be done for. Let's see if I can heat that thing and um, like a hammer or something to wedge that into in position so that it can't come out as I'm trying to turn it. But yeah, I think some heat is definitely in order. swing that way. Let me go get some leverage. Oh yeah, there's some left. <sighs> All right, didn't take much. It actually worked. Yep, that got it. There you can really see the difference between no water and water in your oil. So I haven't tested it yet. I just pulled into this spot. The ground is soft. There's, there's a, a rise right there by that wheel. You can see this one sunk into the ground a little bit. Before making this actual four wheel drive, it would not have been able to pull out of this. And I don't know if it will now, but we're gonna try.
in just a second you can see here it kind of high centers because there's a little hump that it's going over the wheel that's closest to the camera and the one diagonally opposite are taking most of the weight leaving the other two wheels free to freewheel and essentially uh, does what it did b before I had the four-wheel drive fixed. They make lifts with oscillating axles for that reason, meaning the axle can pivot back and forth to keep all four wheels equally on the ground, but uh, obviously mine doesn't have that feature. Instead, now I can just redirect it downslope and it easily pulls out. Alright guys, let's talk about this boom project. In my last video I said that I was considering tearing the boom apart and inspecting everything and replacing whatever needs replacing. That's a huge job and that's what I mean when I'm talking about the boom project. Uh, I kind of wish I had included some more information when, uh, when I suggested that. Comments were kind of all over the spectrum. Many people said if it ain't broke don't fix it. Uh, many people said your life depends on that, you absolutely have to do that. And uh, many wanted to know, you know, what's the manufacturer recommend? Well, JLG recommends that the boom is completely torn down and inspected and reassembled every two years. All the lifts that are in service, whether it's a rental company or on any job site, OSHA requires an annual inspection on, on all man lifts. In that annual inspection, to pass, it has to have had a boom teardown within the last two years. So every lift in the USA, at least, out there that's in use has had a boom teardown within the last two years. A big part of the problem is I don't know the history of this thing. I think the last time that this thing had maintenance was in 2009. Now was that an actual OSHA inspection in 2009? I don't know. Best case scenario, the last time this boom was torn down was probably 2008, 2007, something like that. So it has been 15 years since this boom was inspected. And since then, I just don't know the status of, of what's happened to it. I know it's been used intermittently. I don't think it's been used a whole lot, uh, but I don't know if it's been abused in that time. It's probably fine. These things are way over engineered, but my butt depends on this. My life actually depends on this. And my kids have a lot of fun in this thing too. So, so I really want to know that this thing is right. I usually uh, agree with the adage of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. This is a little different. Uh, I would say that this is more of a, if your butt depends on it, at least make sure it ain't broke. <laughs> you know, I just want to get in there and take a look at everything and make sure there's not some par area of the chain that's just completely rusting and seized and cracking. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. So the chain is what's supporting you when you're telescoped. It's a chain and a, and a hydraulic cylinder together. But if the chain breaks, the telescope is going to drop. So if you're up in the air and you're telescoped and that chain breaks, you're coming down, at least to that point. And I don't want to do that. <laughs> you guys might also recall from a previous video, this thing won't telescope all the way out and then retract. You have to bring it up in the air to put, have gravity help or you have to drag it on the ground. So it's not functioning exactly right. The other thing is that makes this an easier decision for me is this is going to be awesome YouTube content. I have a YouTube channel. So I can do this and it's not just a total waste of my time because I've made a good video off of it. I think I'm gonna do it. Um, I haven't totally decided yet, but uh, I don't have anything left to do on this machine. What am I gonna do? <laughs> I gotta fix something. Some other things I didn't mention is, you know, this thing is taking a shot. This is, this is bent. Looks like it's been bent back. And I had to bend this back. And then there's also some damage over here. So something fell across this. And, you know, probably not that bad, but to bend these, these things are pretty hefty. You know, it got hit pretty hard. Has the boom been inspected since that happened? Yes, it's probably fine, but I don't know the answer. The other thing is, is that hydraulic cylinder in there, I think weeps a little bit of oil. I've seen some evidence of that, but I can't really get in there to get a good look at it without starting to disassemble things. So it's not exactly that it ain't broke. It's going to go and it's going to go fairly soon. I'm going to be doing this at some point. So why don't I do it now before I do all the jobs with it rather than doing it in the middle of a job or after I'm done with all the jobs and I'm just using it uh, less frequently. So there you go, guys. This machine is almost done. The boom teardown, look out for that in the future. Uh, I've got a lot of work left to do with this machine, so even once I finish repairing it, you're still going to see it. 
and uh, I've got something back there that needs a little work. So that's coming up. All sorts of things coming up. So thanks for watching. More content on the way. We'll see you on the next one.